My name is Ton Hagenbeek. I'm a professor of hematology at the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam. And I have the privilege of chairing a session here at RWNHL at Lago Maggiore uh, on the changing landscape of treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, I welcome uh, Professor Frank Moschhauser from Lille in France and Professor Andrew Zelenes from Memorial Sloan Kettering Center in New York. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. So the session will be, have two talks. Your talk on, to give a sort of overview on the new drugs, the promising new drugs that are out there, possibly also some intelligent combinations. And then Andrew follows up on how to integrate that into the uh, near future to have as many patients profit from it as possible. So Frank, the floor is yours. So um, what I will do is uh, try to give an overview of what I think are the most significant drug class. And I selected um, some uh, new uh, antibody drug conjugates, um, the, check, the immune checkpoints, BTK inhibitors, mm -hmm. uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors, ADC, um, and finally uh, epigenetic modifiers. And for each of these drugs, I will give one or two examples of the trials we are running in France. And was, what was striking me is that for most of these trials, we are taking the bulk of the patients. We are not using precision medicine. Right. And then we will try to do translational studies on all of this drug. And this is a current trend. We will also try to select the most significant combinations based on the availability and on the biology when it's feasible. Right. So it's not one size fits all in the beginning? No. And does this mean that this is mainly phase one, phase two trials, single arm studies? It's a mix. Uh, most of the trials are phase one B or two, but there are also some uh, designs of phase three as soon as the drug became available and we could right. make these proposals. You think there's still room for those large conventional phase three randomized trials with 250 patients per arm, having to wait for three, four, five years before the results come out? I know patients it's a, want something else. Yeah, I, I know it's an issue, but this always has been one of the strengths of Europe. And for some of the drug, I think it's the only way to get the answer. Mm -hmm. We cannot only do algorithm, and uh, precision starting with sub this subtype and this subtype. We need some kind of larger trial to get a real sense of uh, the benefit for the patients. So but could, you, could you give an example of a new drug, an antibody drug conjugate or whatever you're going to discuss, how that goes from phase one to phase two and to which particular group of patients in the phase three trial? Let's, a speaking example. Yeah, a speaking example. Uh, one of the best examples is BTK inhibitors. Mm -hmm. So uh, in phase 1b, in phase 1, you tested everything. In phase 1b, also, you could have all the histologies. And then in phase 3, they selected to do ABC because it was subtype where the drug was the most efficient. But right. still, we have some designs of phase 1b where uh, the BTK inhibitors is incorporated with DHAB, for example, mm -hmm. for all the relapsed patients because mm -hmm. we need some follow-up trial for the choral trial. Right. And then we will stratify. Does it make sense? We do not know at the present time. Right. And we have also many other drugs like epigenetic modifiers that are supposed to be very precise, molecularly targeted. But in the end, when you look at the phase one results, it's also efficient in ABC and in GC, mutated or not. Right. So it's maybe still too early to stratify from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now then, with all these new drugs available, I mean, it gets harder and harder and smaller groups of patients to really develop intelligent approaches. So how would you integrate all this new knowledge that comes out on a daily basis well, into clear-cut, profitable designs for patients? Right. You're exactly right. This is the problem we have. We're in part a victim of our own success. If we look at large cell lymphoma with current therapy today will cure about 70% of patients who walk in the door. Right. Which means that um, we have a substantial room for improvement, but we're against a backdrop of uh, a really effective treatment and getting from 70 to 90, you know, requires these enormous large scale randomized trials. Plus, we have a lot of promising agents, whether it's 
lenalidomide or brutinib or bortezomib for the ABC tumor or EZH2 inhibitors for the non uh, GC large cell lymphomas um, or the checkpoint inhibitors in the indolent lymphomas. We have a plethora of drugs and we have to figure out how to do appropriate combinations. Right. So the, uh, instead of the randomized trial with 800 or 1,000 patients, which is what's required to show some of these smaller differences, I feel that we need to come up with some novel strategies. Um, and with some patient selection, if the phase one, two data, for instance, in uh, lenalidomide, supports that activated B cell lymphomas are the target population, yes, you can be a purist, like in the ECOG study, and put everyone on and reconfirm that it's an ABC effect. Or you can say, I don't want to expose patients needlessly to treatment, those GC patients could go on to another study or another question, and I'm going to only ask the question in ABC patients. And you know, we actually have two trials, large randomized trials, for that exact question, one in unselected patients and one in selected patients. Yeah. So that's just an example of how, now the question is how many layers <coughs> of selection do we want? Because as we select and we select again, we take relatively rare tumors. I mean, other than large cell lymphoma, which is considered actually by numbers a rare tumor, but it's, we consider it pretty common. But if we start subsetting, you know, we say large cell lymphoma, only ABC, only ABC without CART11 mutation, yeah, all of a sudden we've turned common tumors into very rare tumors. Right. Um, and there's an advantage if the treatments we have have a very big effect size because then we can actually do very small trials right. with very big effect sizes and get the, the trials done and, and see a result. Um, but you know, one of the things we've learned at Memorial in doing selected trials, we're doing a trial in patients who have CREB-BP mutations, we're looking at a HDAC inhibitor, mucetinostat, um, in follicular lymphoma and large cell lymphoma. Um, and you know, there's reasonable rationale to do this study, but we're looking particularly at the patients with CREB-BP or EP300 mutations. But that's mutations. a small subgroup, as you said. And, and our challenge has been that you know, f getting the testing done, the testing takes a while to come back, so we do it on their prior treatment, so we have a whole lot of patients right. currently in remission from their last treatment who, when they relapse, can go on my study, right, right. but they're not, right. they haven't relapsed yet. But there's such small subgroups of patients. Will you ever be able to run large randomized trials, phase three trials that take ages? Well, but it, see, it's all about the uh, effect size. And that's where I think we have to be just much more brutal than we have in the past. Right. If there's not a big impact size in the early studies, you throw the drug away. Right. We have a right. lot of drugs. Right. We have not that many patients. Right. Um, and we have to be willing to say we're, we're going to throw a drug yeah. away. How about the idea of the basket trials, where only small groups of patients are subjected to different combinations, and you pick the winner and go ahead with that? So basket trials have been very popular, particularly at Memorial, uh, particularly in solid tumors. Um, there are potential issues with basket trials, um, but you can pick up signals in basket trials and then be able to develop in a disease specific way. I actually like the idea of basket trials in lymphoid malignancies because even though they're all different diseases and the biologies really are different, there's a lot of shared pathways right. in these malignancies so that if you do a basket, a mantle cell and marginal zone and CLL and, and large cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma are in the basket and you see a signal at least you have some way of going forward. Right, right. One of the other big challenges that we have, and this is one I'm not entirely sure how we can solve, is there might be some drugs that are really superior in combination and are actually very uninteresting to single agents. Right. And actually, if you think about venetoclax, that's a per perfectly good example. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the surprising result, is in CLL that it works. And 
it's, you know, now we know from Tony Latai's, you know, results that it has the BH3 profiling that puts it right on the edge. But with other diseases, you know, you have to sort of push the tumor towards the edge of the cliff with additional things that induce apoptosis. So, you know, you get very modest single agent response yeah, rates. Yeah. It's quite likely we're gonna have much more dramatic right, response right. rates when we combine these drugs. Okay, Frank, if I turn to you, does that appeal to you, the smaller basket approach to pick the winner instead it, of it those makes huge sense. studies? It's, it's not always easy, I would say, to select the um, primary objective for uh, saying that this agent is better than one agent in another uh, in the basket protocol trial. And the other concern I have is that for drugs like the immune checkpoints inhibitors, how are you going to select a population? In follicular lymphoma patient, how are you going to stratify the patients? So you gave a good example with ABC and diffuse large vessel lymphoma, but for all the other lymphoma, we are so far, as of today, not able to stratify the patients. And we would need those larger phase three randomized trials, even if it's not uh, satisfactory from our mm. perspective. Well, let, let me address one other issue, and that is from the patient's perspective. Yeah. Give you an example from oncology, where we know now that in women with ovary carcinoma, a significant fraction carries the BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation that is sensitive to a PARP inhibitor like Olaparib. But there are also other solid tumors that have the same mutation, irrespective of the origin of the tumor, like in several types of lung cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer. So if these patients stand up and say, listen, I have a BRCA BRAC one BRCA2 mutation in my pancreatic carcinoma, I want to have Olaparib off-label, and I don't want to enter a large randomized trial, I will never survive that. I mean, that is also a tendency, at least in the Netherlands, and our government has a law that if there is sufficient medical and scientific support for such an approach, it should be reimbursed by the insurance company. So instead of running large randomized trials, register those patients with pancreatic carcinoma that take the drug. And if you have 100 and with significant follow-up, you can make up your mind. How does that approach appeal to you? It's a completely different right. mindset. I mean, it's a different approach. See, what I would say about the, the checkpoint inhibitor and low-grade lymphoma I would actually argue that we have a really quite dramatic responses in a subset of patients. And it's more, in my opinion, more cost effective to spend a lot of resources in the phase two to get the, the biomarker studies and some hints. I mean, for instance, in the melanoma field, one of the hints is if there are oligoclonal T cells, present at the time of before treatment, that's a very strong predictor for response to a checkpoint inhibitor. Well, that's an easy thing to validate in the lymphomas. You do immunoseq and you look for oligoclonal T cells if they're present and you ask, is there a correlation? So we can do some of these correlative studies in the phase two that would allow us to then pre-select some patients yeah. In the, for the phase three, and then, yes, we might be taking a few patients who would respond to the checkpoint inhibitors and excluding them, but there are six other drugs we want to test in follicular lymphoma, so those patients who are lower likelihood of response, they go on to the other basket, and but the yeah. one that has the right biomarker, you know, goes, yes, it's not perfect, but when we have, when we're faced with very good outcomes so far. We need to identify ways of improving these outcomes in smaller groups with a large number of drugs. I think this sort of pre-selection is going to help us just move the, right. you know, move right. ahead right. and get the well, results. You gave a done. speaking example, but I still want to come back to what I just tried to indicate: the new way of thinking, also from the patient perspectives, our strong patient advocacy movements that say we don't want to wait for five years till the reasons of right. phase three are there. But you the, want to have it. Yeah, that's right true. However, there are problems, you know, and I think verafinib is a good example. Okay, it works in some diseases where there, you have a BRAF mutation and in other diseases, it doesn't do a thing. So the, but we learned that 
from a basket trial. So right. I would argue that those patients with the PARP inhibitor should in fact go on a clinical trial. They should be in a basket trial. Right. Right. And we should see if there's a signal At an early stage. for those patients. At an early stage. If there is, then I'm more uh, comfortable with more general early right, access, right, right, but right. You, you you really want to know there's a signal. There's a station, station a in signal. between. A station you in have between. to know there's a signal. Okay. I would agree with um, with Andrew, but how many centers in one country are really able to afford this analysis and this basket protocol? Yeah, well, that's a critical issue, and in particular in smaller, well-organized countries where the yeah. lines are short, you could try to do it centrally, yeah. but in the larger countries and financially less uh, strong, it may pose a difficulty. So thank you very much. Maybe you can, both of you, have a short take-home message from this meeting and from your session. Frank. From my session, um, I think it, it helped me really prioritize which drug combination and which strategy I would like to develop in the near future okay. um, with this standpoint of today. Probably in five years, it will be completely different. Right, right. Andrew? Um, I think with the opportunity that uh, Frank's going to talk about and the great number of drugs, um, we have to be somewhat sophisticated about coming up with novel approaches so that we can screen many drugs at one time and actually abandon drugs that really look like they, sh they, they really don't have a lot of promise. Thank you very much.